This video is sponsored by Morning Brew. Hey, happy Friday. This week, Intel made a major announcement for Europe. The Samsung Galaxy A series got a huge new update, and we also got a super interesting look at Android chipset market share. Our technology quiz is back again this week with 20 questions. See how many of them you can get right in five minutes. Links are in the description, and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week's are all about Xiaomi. First, the flagship Xiaomi 12 series finally launched globally after launching in China back in December last year. There's the regular 12 again and the Pro that costs an eye-watering 1,049 euros. That is Samsung's territory. These phones do feel very nice in hand, but they're wildly expensive for a Xiaomi. They have no IP rating, no telephoto lens, etc. At that price, the Galaxy S22 Plus just says buy me instead, let alone the Pixel 6 for example. There's also a pair of new smartwatches in the Xiaomi Watch S1 and S1 Active, which launched globally, and Xiaomi also launched the Redmi K50 series in China, which finally featured the MediaTek Dimensity 9000 and 8100 SoCs. I can't wait to hear how they actually perform, and I really hope that we get these chips outside of China soon as well. And finally, Google released the Android 13 Developer Preview 2, with mostly small tweaks like a new notification permission that Google will require developers developers to use. Okay, and my first story of the week is going to be Intel announcing big, big plans for Europe, with the biggest announcement being 17 billion euros to be spent to build a foundry in Magdeburg in Germany, which the company is now calling Silicon Junction. This new flagship foundry will supposedly feature two first-of-their-kind semiconductor fabs, where Intel's most advanced Angstom-era transistor technologies will produce chips by 2027. The Angstom-era, by Intel's naming standards at least, just means transistors that are smaller than nanometers, and apparently individual atoms are roughly the size of Angstoms. Wild! This fab should produce chips both for Intel internally and for external foundry customers, so theoretically in a couple of years we could have chips like those of Qualcomm or Nvidia made right here in Europe as well. Beyond that, Intel already has a fab in Ireland where they've been making 14 nanometer chips. Up until now, this was kind of the only somewhat high-end chip fab in all of Europe. And an additional 12 billion euros will go to upgrading that to their four nanometer process technology in the next few years as well. And beside, Intel is also dangling a few more carrots in front of European governments to get some funding. In Italy, a back-end manufacturing facility is being discussed, which basically means a chip packaging plant with 4.5 5 billion euros on the table, depending on negotiations, and there are plans for expanding research and chip design facilities across France, Poland, Belgium, and Spain. That totals 33 to 80 billion euros, depending on how the negotiations go. Of course, that will be spread out over many years, and it looks like the EU might actually have to end up paying for a large amount of that with very generous subsidies. The EU currently only produces about 6% of the world's advanced chips, and other countries give massive subsidies as well, with South Korea, for example, reportedly often paying up to 40% of a fab construction costs. The EU has 43 billion euros up for grabs, and Intel will be helping itself to as much of that as it can, with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger carefully saying that the exact amount was not yet finalized. These are of course also promises, so we don't actually know how much of them will happen, but since Intel's entire new strategy seems to be doubling down on building new fabs across across the US and Europe, it seems like there's a chance that a lot of them will. Funnily enough, Intel's shares have actually fallen 25% since Gelsinger became CEO and announced expanding the manufacturing business, as that expansion is expensive and cuts down on short-term profits. Europe does have a somewhat competent chip industry for making automotive chips from the likes of Infineon and Bosch, for example, and it's exciting to see that with the new Intel investments, the continent could finally have a chance of being at the leading edge of consumer electronics for once as well. Too bad Intel is not a European company, but oh well, it's still a big deal, especially after we saw how badly Russia and China were hurt by not having their own chip fabs in the last couple of years. Okay, my second story of the week is going to be Samsung's A-series phones. The company has just revealed the Galaxy A53 and the A33, and I realized that I haven't really talked much about the A-series in the past, so here is some background for you. The phones themselves are pretty decent. The A53 is somehow cheaper at 450 bucks than last year's 
Galaxy A52, and the pre-order even includes a free pair of Galaxy Buds in some markets, so good job on that Samsung. And they come with your usual upper mid-range specs. Four cameras, a big 5000 mAh battery, and a 120Hz LTPO AMOLED screen, which is really cool, and interestingly, a new 5 nanometer processor that Samsung weirdly didn't actually name. The Google Play console reveals that it is probably an Exynos 1280, which should be a step up from the A52's Snapdragon 750G, so overall a very competitive package. And with that in mind, I actually dug out some interesting data from Counterpoint. The A-series phones apparently made up 58% of Samsung's sales in 2021, meaning that they sold more than all of Samsung's other series combined. That is a ton of phones, and according to another piece of data from Counterpoint, the A12 was also the best-selling phone of Samsung last year, and the only one that actually made it to the global top 10 at 2% of all smartphone sales. So yeah, the A-series being good is super important for both consumers and Samsung, and it looks like at least with these last two models, they did a really good job. Selling a lot of A-series phones allows Samsung to get higher volumes, which is critical for keeping their other businesses like displays, memory and processors healthy and competitive. And fingers crossed that the new Exynos chip in this new phone will actually perform well. Okay, and my third story of the week is going to be this super interesting chart, once again from Counterpoint, showing the chipset share for Android smartphones broken into price bands. This chart gives us so much to talk about, but here are my four key takeaways. First, overall market share figures can be pretty misleading. One of the big headlines from 2021 was that MediaTek overtook Qualcomm for market share of Android chipsets. That is true, but in reality, Qualcomm is dominating the premium end with its Snapdragon 888 and 8 Gen 1. MediaTek is really only a major player in the mid to low end for now, and above $300, Qualcomm really takes over with its high-end chips. Similarly, we saw the meteoric rise of Unisoc in overall market market share, but looking at price bands again, we can see that they too have really only made a dent in even cheaper categories so far. Still, a 26% share in the sub $99 band is not bad, I guess. Second, I was surprised to see that somehow Huawei is still selling a surprising amount of high silicon SoCs. The company still had a 16% share in phones priced at $500 and above, as it sold down its remaining inventory last year, which it can't really replenish due to the US trade ban. Third, Exynos actually had a healthy share of the premium market, even beating Qualcomm's share in the $700 range, but it is in decline, especially in the mid-high segment, where its share declined from 13% in 2020 to 6% in 2021, with Samsung's mobile business integrating competitors in the A, F, and M series phones, because Exynos SoCs have failed to see major refreshes here. Whoever's running the Exynos division at Samsung is probably in quite a lot of trouble, and it's only gonna get worse for them this year as the Snapdragon chips have actually been featured in even more S22 series devices this year as well. And finally, it's fun to see Google's small share displayed here for the first time ever, despite only having two devices with it in the market for now. Not bad. All right, another big news story that is being talked about is the Netflix password sharing crackdown, where Netflix will be testing out household limitations for the first time. For details and for knowing whether the new rules will actually affect you, you can check out my sponsor, Morning Brew, which is where I first read about this story and many others like it. Morning Brew is the free daily newsletter that I read Monday to Sunday, which covers news, info, stats, and graphics about tech, business, and whatever else is relevant in a fun and simple format that is quite similar in approach to what I do here on my show. The topics make sense to know about each day, the writing keeps things moving, and you can stay up to date. I read it while I drink my first cup of coffee in the morning, and I find that getting a hit of analysis with my caffeine is a great way to start the day, and it definitely beats morning doom scrolling on social media. Signing up only takes a few seconds, it is free, and there's really no reason not to sign up. Click on the link in the description, and you'll be all set. 